Welcome to today's briefing. I'm pleased to be joined by Professor Steve Powers, the National Medical Director at NHS England. First of all, I would like to update you on the latest data in respect of the coronavirus response. So first of all, 2,962,227 tests for coronavirus have now been carried out in the United Kingdom. And that includes 177,216 tests which were carried out yesterday. 248,293 people have tested positive. That's an increase of 2,472 cases since yesterday. 9,953 people are currently in hospital with coronavirus. That is down 13% from 11,443 this time last week. And sadly, of those who have tested positive for coronavirus across all settings, 35,704 have now sadly died. That is an increase of 363 fatalities since yesterday. And of course, my thoughts are with every one of the families of those people who have been affected by this. And before we begin questions from the public and from the media, I just want to remind people of the details of the next phase of our fight against coronavirus. So, slide one, please. So, as you'll see from slide one, first, in order to monitor our progress, we're establishing a new COVID alert level system with five levels, each relating to the level of threat posed by the virus. The alert system will be based primarily on the R value and the number of coronavirus cases. And in turn, that alert level will determine the level of social distancing measures in place. The lower the level, the fewer the measures. The higher the level, the stricter the measures. And throughout the period of lockdown, which started on March the 23rd, we've been at level four. But thanks to the hard work and sacrifices of the British people in this lockdown, we've helped to bring the R level down, and we're now in a position to begin moving to level three in careful steps. May we have slide two, please? So as you'll see from this slide, we have set out the first of three steps we will take to carefully modify the measures, gradually ease the lockdown, and begin to allow people to return to their normal way of life. But crucially, avoiding what would be a disastrous second peak which overwhelms the NHS. And after each step, we will closely monitor the impact of that step on R and the number of infections and all the available data, and we will only take the next step when we are satisfied that it is safe to do so. So step one, as the Prime Minister announced this week, those who cannot work from home should now speak to their employer about going back to work. You can spend time outdoors and exercise as often as you like, and you can meet one person outside your household in an outdoor public place, provided that you stay two metres apart. Slide three, please. So as you'll see from slide three, having taken the first step in carefully adjusting some of the measures and our advice on what people can do, we've also updated what we are asking people to do, which is to stay alert, control the virus, and save lives. Yes, staying alert for the vast majority of people still means staying at home as much as possible. But there are a range of other actions that we're advising people to take. So people should stay alert by working from home if you can, limiting contact with other people, keeping distance if you go out two metres apart where possible, and washing your hands regularly, wearing face covering when you're in enclosed spaces, where it's difficult to be socially distant, so for example in some shops and on public transport. And if you or anyone in your household has symptoms, you all need to self-isolate. Because if everyone stays alert and follows the rules, we can control coronavirus by keeping the R down and reducing the number of infections. This is how we can continue to save lives and livelihoods as we begin as a nation to recover from coronavirus. Now, over the past months, we've all naturally been focused on the huge life or death health implications of this pandemic. But I'd now like to provide an update on some of the crucial work taking place behind the scenes to support and protect the things that give our lives added meaning, such as sport, art, tourism, and our charities, music and theatres. 
And when we look back on the coronavirus, one of the things we'll remember is the incredible contribution made by so many people. And as a way of showing our national gratitude to these everyday COVID heroes, we're announcing today that we're delaying Her Majesty the Queen's birthday honours list until the autumn so that they can be recognised and celebrated. And as the Prime Minister said today, I'm delighted that Her Majesty the Queen has approved a knighthood for Captain Tom Moore in recognition of his outstanding achievement in raising nearly £33 million for NHS charities. And Captain Tom set a marker of generosity and the public have matched it. Incredibly, it now looks as if British people and businesses have now contributed over £800 million, and that's just through national fundraising campaigns alone. And a great deal more has obviously been raised at local levels. And as the British people have generously given their time and their money, the government has sought to back them every step of the way. So we promised to match every penny raised by the BBC's Big Night In campaign, and after a fantastic public response, I'm delighted to announce today that over £70 million is now being distributed by Comic Relief, Children in Need and the National Emergencies Trust to charities on the front line. Now, this comes on top of the hundreds of millions of pounds we've already announced for charities doing vital work to support those suffering from poor mental health, to help the victims of domestic abuse and to make sure hospices can continue to care for families in these most difficult of circumstances. And today, I'm pleased to confirm that the government's dedicated support scheme for small and medium-sized charities, the Coronavirus Community Support Fund, will open for applications this week. Initially, there will be a £200 million tranche of government funding, and this will be administered by the National Lottery Community Fund. And this will focus on those charities we may not know nationally, but who are a lifeline to communities at a local level. And on top of that, I can also announce today that we're releasing £150 million from dormant accounts to help social enterprises get affordable credit to people who are financially vulnerable and to support charities tackling youth unemployment. So our charities, both large and small, have really been at the forefront of this national effort to defeat the coronavirus. And together, all of this amounts to a multi-billion pound boost for Britain's charities. And I know that people are also eager for news of the return of live sports and the arts. And I know that the last few months have felt rather odd without them and our, our calendars have been strangely bare. Finding creative, crowd-free ways to navigate coronavirus is the biggest challenge for our recreation and leisure sectors right now. So this week, I'm setting up a renewal task force which will help them bounce back. It'll be made up of the brightest and the best from creative, tech and sporting worlds. These are experts in their field and they'll be advising me on how they find new and different ways to get industries back up and running. And just to give a few examples, it includes Alex Scott, a former lioness and Olympian and now an award-winning broadcaster, and she will help us think through how we can get sport back safely in a way that works for both clubs, players and supporters alike. Similarly, Lord Grade, former chairman of both the BBC and ITV, will provide an insight as to how we get our creative uh, media industries back up and flourishing again. And Tamara Rojo, the English National Ballet's artistic director, will give us ideas for how we start to get our art scene back up and running. And Martha Lane Fox, uh, well known as founder of lastminute.com, will advise on how tech can power all of this recovery across all these sectors, but particularly in tourism, as part of the much wider role it will play in driving our economy forward as it has done already. Meanwhile, Bit by bit, we are developing guidance that's helping some of the lighter bits of our economy return to this new normal. So we have supported the safe return of TV production, meaning our broadcasters are able to keep some of our favourite shows uh, back on the TV screens, whether that's Corrie or EastEnders. We've helped to reopen the country's tennis and basketball courts and guided at least back athletes back into training safely. And that, in turn, will pave the way for the return of live sports uh, behind closed doors in the near future. Normal life, as we have known it, is still clearly a long way off. And the path to get there is a narrow one. But these things will return when it's safe for them to do so. And thanks to the same drive and creativity that makes a great performance or a great piece of art. And I really think that when they do, and when we've come overcome this crisis together, we'll appreciate them that much more. 
And with that, I'll hand over to Professor Steve Bowles. Thank you very much, Secretary of State, and good afternoon. Uh, if I could uh, go through the data slides for today, uh, with which I'm sure you have become familiar. So the first slide shows information on social distancing uh, and how the British public have responded to the requests that we all socially distance in order to reduce the rate at which the virus, the coronavirus, is transmitted through our communities. And as I've said before, it's only by doing that uh, that we will keep this under control, that we will reduce the number of deaths that we have unfortunately seen and the number of admissions to the NHS and the pressure on the NHS. So this uh, slide shows a number of graphs, uh, data from both vehicle uh, um, mobility, so transport in cars and light vehicles and heavy goods vehicles. And you can see there has been a slow uh, increase uh, in uh, vehicle movements, uh, probably recently reflecting uh, the uh, uh, desire for um, people who can return to work who can't work from home uh, returning. Uh, but on public transport, uh, national rail, transport for London and bus outside of London, you can see that the levels of usage are still very low and very much down on what they were before social distancing measures were introduced. So again, evidence that the British public has responded to and complied with the instructions that we've all been given. On the next slide, we uh, start to look at testing and uh, the number of new cases that are test positive. And as you've heard from the Secretary of State, there has been uh, an increase in recent weeks, both in the capacity of testing and in the number of people who are being tested. And you can see that uh, at the graph uh, at the start. We're now nearly up to uh, 3 million tests that have been performed in total. In the lower graph, you can see the number of daily confirmed cases. And again, as I've said uh, recently, that although the testing capacity has increased and the number of tests has increased, the number of daily confirmed cases has not increased and, in fact, is stable or perhaps even falling. And I think that shows that the uh, amount of transmission, the amount of virus in the community is falling. Uh, and with an R rate uh, less than one, that is exactly what we would, would expect. In the next slide, we'll see how that translates into the usage of hospitals. Now, once again, for the vast majority of people, this is a mild illness that does not require hospital care. But for a minority of people, unfortunately, hospital admission is required. And for the sickest, of course, that might require a period on our intensive care units. So this shows the uh, new daily admissions with COVID-19 uh, from March through uh, to now. You can see uh, that that is uh, on a decline. Uh, so we are seeing fewer and fewer daily admissions again, uh, showing the benefits of social distancing. And then in the bottom graph, you can see that group of individuals who unfortunately are our sickest and require uh, ventilation. So they need to be put on a ventilator uh, and mechanically ventilated. Uh, those, uh, that obviously occurs in our intensive care units and, and those areas that we are, we are using as part of our expanded capacity to do this. And you can see again that that number is falling uh, across all parts uh, of the UK, again reflecting the benefits of social uh, distancing. Next slide uh, shows uh, more data in hospital, uh, and I would highlight that the number of people in hospital is now below 10,000. So I think that's the first time since March that we have seen a fall that has uh, come down below 10,000 in terms of the people who are actively in hospital uh, with uh, uh, test positive for COVID-19. Uh, you can see in the individual chart showing various parts of, of the UK that the fall, the decline has been steepest in London that had the highest uh, peak, but also you will see declines in other areas of the country at different rates, uh, but all heading uh, surely in the, the right direction, so a fall in the number of people in hospital. Um, and then in the next slide, finally, we show the number of deaths. Uh, and you have heard the numbers uh, for today. Uh, clearly, uh, it's with great uh, sadness that we report these deaths. Uh, but you see on a daily basis that looking at the key figure, the seven-day rolling average, which takes out the variation between days and particularly the reporting variation at weekends, you can see that the trend is now consistently downwards. And that will continue to fall as long as we all comply with the instructions that we've been given around social distancing. So, so this is not the time uh, to, uh, to, as I said before, to uh, become complacent about this. Yes, if you can't work at home, 
then uh, talk to your employer about getting uh, to work. But uh, we need to remain vigilant, we need to stay alert, and we need to make sure that we keep that important R0, that R number below one, so that the rate of transmission is continually declining in the population. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you very much for that very clear presentation. Uh, we now turn to questions. First of all, we're going to go to Thomas from the Northwest, and he's joining us by video. Good afternoon. Please, can you give an update on what the UK is doing to help the poorer nations through this pandemic? Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much for that question, Thomas, and it's a really Im important question. The first thing that we've done to help uh, poorer nations is we're standing by our commitment to the poorest nations by devoting 0.7% of our entire national income to going to aid. And that, despite all the challenges we have faced during the uh, coronavirus and all the pressures on public spending, we are maintaining that commitment. And I know there's a lot of concern about whether poorer nations are going to be able to access vaccines. That's why through the Gavi programme, we will also ensure that we get those uh, vaccines at an affordable uh, level, working with our uh, aid budget to those poorest nations. Fulfilling, I think, the what we've always done as a nation. We've always stood by uh, the poorest nations in, in time of need. And I think that's part of the moral responsibility we show as a nation. Uh, I think now we have question number two, and that is from Heather in Devon. So just to, to read that out, Heather asks, I, like many others, have had medical reviews delayed as nurses who conducted them were redeployed to the front line and are currently still working in hospitals. How long will it be before those NHS staff can go back to their normal jobs? Well, um, first of all, I'd like to pay tribute, uh, Heather, to all of uh, the nurses and uh, other frontline staff in the NHS who've done so much during this crisis to help us tackle it. And through that crisis, and thanks to their hard work, we have avoided the NHS being overwhelmed. But clearly, in uh, moving that capacity to the front line to deal with coronavirus, it has had knock-on consequences elsewhere. As we now move out of the peak, and we're working, of course, to ensure that we don't have a second peak where the NHS is overwhelmed, there is more capacity again, so we can start uh, delivering uh, more capacity to deal with these sort of challenges. But Professor Stephen Bowers, only a Yes, so thank you, Heather. And I too would like to pay tribute to all my colleagues in the NHS who've worked so magnificently over the last few months to deal with the surge in patients that we've seen with COVID-19. And it is, it is the case that some of those staff have had to be redeployed. They've had to work in different areas and, and sometimes they've had to work with a set of skills that they have, but they, they haven't uh, had to use, use in recent years. And I think it's, it's been truly inspiring the way people have uh, stood up uh, and um, taken that task and, and delivered for the, the public in this country. Um, as I've said uh, many times before, in the NHS, we have kept our emergency services going throughout this. Uh, and so if you have symptoms that you're worried about, maybe symptoms of you're worried about a heart attack or a stroke, if you've got uh, a child with severe asthma, then don't be afraid to use the NHS as you've always used it. It is still there for you. Yes, we are managing and have been managing an increase, increased number of people uh, with COVID-19, but the NHS is there for emergency conditions, and it's really important you don't delay getting in touch with us through 111, through calling your GP, or in extreme circumstances, dialing 999. Uh, we've also kept services such as cancer going throughout this. There has been some disruption um, and, and some patients I know uh, have been advised by their clinicians uh, not uh, to have treatment immediately uh, because, uh, for instance, if their immune system is being, is being uh, treated uh, as part of their cancer treatment is being depressed, then uh, there, there may be a reason not to do that at a time when virus is circulating. But um, now that we've come over the peak, we are in a position, as the Secretary of State says, to start to build up those NHS services uh, where we've had to redeploy staff and perhaps that we uh, have had to delay. So you will see over the next uh, weeks and months uh, a standing up uh, of all those NHS services so that the routine reviews can start to be uh, done again. Uh, but I'm sure everybody understands uh, that um, at a time of public emergency where we saw that surge in the virus over April, it was the right thing to do to make sure that our staff were focused on the response to that. Uh, but now we can start to get back towards um, 
normal, although a new normal, because we will have to do that in the context of still having some underlying COVID-19 uh, in the community. Thank you. Uh, now I think we come to the next question, and that's from Nick Watt for the BBC. Nick, are you there? Thank you. I have a question for you, Secretary of State, and a question for Professor Powis. So, Oliver Dowden, in his televised address earlier this month, the Prime Minister talked about the awful epidemic in care homes. And this morning, your Cabinet colleague, Robert Buckland, uh, uh, acknowledged um, that uh, care homes were uh, given less priority for testing than the NHS at the start of this crisis. And then he said, sadly, there were far too many cases of infection and deaths in care homes. And yet at Prime Minister's questions today, Boris Johnson appeared to brush aside concerns and questions about the level of testing in the early stages of this public emergency. So, so what is it? Gloss over possible mistakes in the past or face up to the fact, as Robert Buckland said, that maybe things could have been done differently. And for Professor Powis, can I ask you, your scientific colleague, Dame Angela McLean, uh, said yesterday in answer to a question of what the schools can open on the 1st of June, she said that you need to have a highly effective track, trace and isolation system in place. Uh, today, the Prime Minister said that there will be a test track and trace system, it will be in place, he said, by the 1st of June. Now, given that there have been sort of uh, moving about on the dates about when this might happen from ministers, are you confident, Professor Powis, that the McLean conditions will be met, given that there are concerns over the app, and whilst there will be 25,000 trackers who will be able to track 10,000 cases a day, and yes, that is four times the number of confirmed cases, that is probably well below the number of actual cases in the UK. Well, thank you for that question, uh, Nick. Perhaps I deal with the first one about glossing over and then uh, hand over to you, Stephen Powers. It is categorically not the case that we have glossed over this, and I think the Prime Minister has been very clear about the challenges that we face in care homes. And, of course, every death in a care home is, is one too many. But that is precisely why we have introduced this care home action plan. That means there's more money going into care homes. For example, an extra £600 million was announced very recently. That's why we're ramping up the testing uh, in care homes. That's why we're ramping up the protective equipment for care homes. Why, for example, we've introduced a dedicated hotline so that they can get that protective equipment into care homes. And actually, as a result of those measures, whilst the numbers remain too high, the indicators suggest that we are moving in the right direction, whether that is reducing number of deaths or reducing number of new infections. Uh, Stephen Powers. Yes, so um, maybe going back to the first principle about the, the, the overall strategy, um, what's important is to keep the R, the R number below one, as I said a little bit earlier, because it's only by keeping the R below one that the rate of transmission falls in the community. In other words, the amount that is being passed on from person to person uh, is less than one on average, and therefore the infection rate is going down. And, and you achieve that in a variety of ways, and track and trace uh, is one component uh, of the measures that will need to be kept in place, at least in the foreseeable future, to ensure that R is below one. So the first point I'd make is, is as, as, as Angela said yesterday, uh, track and trace and an effective track and trace uh, um, uh, strategy in place is a very important component of keeping the infection under control, but it's not the only thing. Uh, it needs to be seen combined with other social distancing measures. Uh, but over time, uh, as, we, uh, uh, as the strategy towards a virus in the community evolves, may, may be relaxed. But Track and trace is not the only thing that needs to be, to be in place. Uh, and I think, uh, as the government has said, clearly timing is an issue for government. It, we can advise, but it's a question for government. Uh, I know the government uh, would want to see, and I think they've said, uh, that they need to have the, uh, the context that there will not be a rise uh, of R above one uh, in order to move in the subsequent steps of any uh, release uh, of lockdown measures. So track and trace, yes, very important but it's just one of the measures that we will need to keep in place going forward to ensure that transmission rates stay below one. Nick, would you like to, to ask any follow-ups? Yes, could I just come back to you, Oliver Dowden? Yes. You're saying that you're not glossing over mm. anything, but there was a very different tone from Robert Buckland today when he was saying maybe things could have been done differently. 
And it's well known that mistakes, honest mistakes, may well have been made, particularly in the beginning phase of this public emergency. And wouldn't it do this government some good? Wouldn't it do the government scientists some good if you followed the example of Emmanuel Macron and acknowledged, admitted, were open about those? There's going to be a public inquiry. You're going to be called up before that public inquiry. So why not begin that conversation now? Well, of course, uh, in any uh, public health crisis like this, there will be a time for lessons to be learned uh, afterwards. But I think the public rightly want us now to be focusing on dealing with this. That is why uh, we have introduced the NHS uh, Care Homes Action Plan, having the consequences I described. And on some of the points you raised, for example, uh, in relation to people who have been discharged from hospitals into to care homes, actually the numbers discharged in March, April were 40 per cent lower than those in January. And it has been the case that testing has been available to care homes right from the very beginning. And it has been the case that, uh, that we have issued guidance right from the very, very beginning. Of course, there are always lessons to be learned, but I think it is worth reflecting on, on those things. Uh, thank you for that question. Now over to uh, Robert Peston. Uh, good afternoon. Um, remarkable data out of Public Health England today. The last 24 hours, or the latest 24-hour period, apparently there were zero cases of coronavirus or new cases in London. So presumably there will be a return to school in the capital, at least, for the youngest children, and more store, st stores opening, at least in the capital. And, and, and a separate one for Professor... Uh, Paris, uh, the Prime Minister today said in the House of Commons that no older people will return to care homes without the approval of a clinician, which seems to many as though the Prime Minister is, in a sense, passing the blame for seeding COVID-19 in care homes to doctors and nurses. What do you think of that, Professor Paris? Uh, well, perhaps shall I start with your, your first question, Robert, about the opening up uh, process, and you, you re reference some of the, the promising figures. I'd also just, it is worth reflecting again on those, those test numbers where we're now up to 177,216 tests. So it's not just the numbers that are moving in the, the right direction, although of course we have to be highly cautious about it, but also the, the government response continues to, to ramp up. Now, the Prime Minister set out the path that we will go down uh, in terms of easing the lockdown. He set out this uh, three-stage uh, process. The next stage, and we've said from the earliest, will be from the beginning of June. We will look at some of the measures that you discussed uh, around, for example, opening up non-essential retail. In respect to the question about schools, I really think we should try and open schools if we possibly can. And a lot of work, I know my friend, the health sec uh, the education secretary has put a lot of work in, has indeed has the health secretary, about thinking about how we can do that safely, whether that is staggering entry times, whether it is keeping uh, children together in groups of, of 15. And the reason for doing all of that is because I think there's very strong evidence that particularly for the most disadvantaged children in those early years, it's not cost free for them not going to school. There is a cost. So if we can get them back in a way that we safely can do so, we should do so. But it will only be guided by the, the evidence that is moving in the right direction at the moment, but, but we will we'll be very cautious about that. Uh, Stephen, is there anything you want to... Thank you, Robert. So, so I was a frontline doctor for many, many years, and I wouldn't uh, discharge a patient uh, from a hospital into whatever setting, home or care home, unless I was absolutely confident that their medical treatment was complete and they no longer required hospital treatment. Uh, and indeed, uh, I think it's always worth making the point that particularly for our elderly population, uh, remaining in hospital when your medical hospital treatment is complete uh, can be harmful uh, to individuals. So I'm absolutely sure that my medical colleagues would not be discharging patients under any circumstances unless they were sure that their medical treatment in hospital was complete, they were fit for discharge, and it was safe to discharge them. Uh, Robert, any, any follow-ups you want to ask? Well, yes, on, just on the uh, return of children to schools and, and non-essential stores, are you allowing the possibility that this could happen on a region-by-region -region basis? Because, as I say, if there are literally no new cases in London, there's a very strong argument that even if other parts of the country are not ready for children to go back and the rest, London is ready. Well, look, we want to proceed as fast as we safely can do so, because clearly there are benefits in the way I described for children, and there are clearly benefits for the wider economy and people's uh, your 
public uh, utility, really, of being able to access those, uh, those non-essential uh, retail. I think it is best, though, and the government has said this repeatedly, that we move as a whole uh, nation, and that would include, of course, the whole of uh, England in, in doing so. Uh, it may be the case that uh, because of the track and trace, clearly within, within track and trace, if we identify specific, very micro hotspots, then, then we would have different measures in, in respect of, of that. But the, the, the clear intention is that we move as a whole, um, whole country. Thank you for your question. Uh, now over to uh, Ben Kentish from LBC. Thank you, Secretary of State. Good afternoon. Three weeks ago on the steps of Downing Street, the Prime Minister talked of the need for the maximum possible transparency and promised that the government would share all its working and thinking with the British people. And yet now you're asking parents to send their children back to school without having published the scientific advice on whether it is safe for them to do so. In effect, asking them to simply take someone else's word for it. If you were a parent without the benefit of being a government minister, would you want to see that advice? And when will the government fulfil the Prime Minister's transparency pledge by publishing it. And just a quick second one, if I may. Uh, under the government's bereavement scheme, the families of frontline doctors and nurses who lose their life fighting coronavirus will be given indefinite leave to remain in the UK. But it was confirmed last night that the families of doctor, uh, porters, carers and cleaners who die in similar circumstances will not. Does the government think the lives of carers, porters and cleaners are worth less than those of doctors and nurses? Or is there another reason for that discrepancy? Thank you. OK, thank you for your questions. There's, there's two questions uh, wrapped up in there, so I, I might resist going back for a, a further one after it. On the, in terms of the, the point about uh, parents uh, sending their children back to school, I'm a, I'm a, a dad of uh, two primary school age children, and I do, of course, genuinely understand parents' uh, concerns are, around this. And they will want to be sure that if they send their children back to school, they do so in a safe environment. But that is why the Education Secretary has been working so hard to ensure that we do develop that safe environment, whether that is staggered entry, whether it's washing hands, whether it is having uh, children kept within groups so that they don't uh, mix with others. All of those are driven by the evidence about how to do this in the, the most safe way possible. We won't proceed unless we can be sure of children's safety. Of course, that goes without saying. In relation to your point about the publication of uh, the evidence, uh, SAGE advice is being published uh, routinely, and there was some further advice published on Friday, and that will continue to be the case. Um, in respect of the, the points you uh, rightly raised about uh, support for, uh, for care workers and others, first of all, just to restate what I said earlier in this press conference, that we all of us owe a huge debt of gratitude to everyone working in the NHS. We all go out and clap at uh, 8 o'clock on, on Thursday evenings to show that appreciation. Uh, one of the measures we've, we've taken to show that appreciation is the, the bereavement support, which is available to everyone, of course, including uh, porters and, and others who make such a huge contribution. In respect of your point about the in, indefinite leave to remain, we do keep that policy uh, under review and uh, we, we will look further into that case. Uh, now I think we'll go over to Jason Groves well, from I'm the team. Yes, go on quickly. Thank you. Yeah. Just, I wondered if Professor Powers had a view on whether the bereavement scheme should be extended to all NHS workers. And just on the school's point, uh, Secretary of State, just wanted to follow up on Nick's point, really. Will the contact tracing system be in place together with the app by the start of June, as Angela McLean suggested yesterday was necessary? Thank you. OK, so I'll try, I'll try and remember those further points. Right? So in respect of the, the contact uh, tracing that uh, the Prime Minister uh, announced fantastic progress at lunchtime today, uh, we've now recruited 25,000 contact tracers. That will um, enable us to undertake uh, 10,000 uh, tracers. Now, given that we are currently at the stage where there's 2,400 uh, cases, that, that is huge progress, and that will be by the beginning of uh, by June, the beginning of June. So that that is really um, important progress. Uh, in respect of the um, indefinite uh, leave to remain, I know that we owe hospitals and others that huge debt of gratitude, and that's why I, I said what I said about um, 
keeping the policy under review. But I, is there anything else well, you'd I want to ask? Well, I think that's a matter for government in terms of keeping the policy under review. But all I can say is, uh, again, as a, as, as a doctor who's worked on the front line for many years, how much I value the entire multidisciplinary uh, team. So everybody from porter to manager to administrator to nurse uh, who, who absolutely work together uh, as a team uh, in managing um, this sort of uh, crisis, but also in the day-to-day -day care that, that, um, that uh, the NHS provides. So it's often the doctors and nurses who are at the, the front and get the praise, but believe me, there are a huge number of people uh, working behind the scenes. I was at the Royal Free when we managed Ebola, and I will always remember the uh, photograph in the Evening Standard that showed the huge team of people, the engineers who kept the plant open being some of the ones I remember the most, who, who kept the uh, the show on the road and allowed those patients to be treated successfully, and that is the case now. Uh, there are many, many heroes within the NHS, not just doctors and nurses. Thank you. Uh, now we go on to uh, Jason Groves from the Daily Mail. Thanks. Mr Devon, um, TV, uh, the TV has been a lifeline for lots of older people uh, through this lockdown. Um, I, I wonder if you're happy to see the over 75s lose their free TV licence in August and whether you might intervene or whether that's a job for the BBC. And Professor Powers, I wonder if I could ask you about the two metre rule. We heard uh, from Robert Dingwall, who's a government advisor earlier, that uh, the actual scientific evidence for keeping us two metres apart while the one is very fragile. Um, I mean, has he got a point? You're on stage, uh, given the importance of that to sectors like education and hospitality. Could you look at it again? Well, shall I deal with uh, the BBC and TV licence first? Uh, the, we've, we were clear, and we've been clear all along, that we didn't want the BBC to take away the free TV licence from the over 75s. I think the BBC made absolutely the right decision in saying that in the middle of this coronavirus crisis, when uh, particularly older people are being asked to self-isolate who and uh, are feeling lonely, often the TV is a lifeline for them, uh, it wouldn't have been acceptable to take away that, that TV uh, licence, which is why they rightly extended the, the proposal for removing it uh, to the uh, beginning of August. I very much hope that if we are in the similar situation uh, come the beginning of August, the BBC will show similar flexibility again. Uh, so on the, on the two metre rule, so I, so I can absolutely assure you that SAGE does keep things uh, under review, not least because the science is constantly evolving. And as we learn more about this virus, then it's quite right that as scientists, we consider new evidence and keep things under review. The, the current uh, guidance, the current advice is two metres. Uh, I'm sure that along with a whole host of other things, that will constantly be kept under review as new evidence uh, emerges. Uh, Jason, any follow ups to that? Yeah, well, we don't get you very often, uh, Secretary <laughs> of State. So, can uh, I ask you there's meant to be a follow-up, not a new question. But go on. well, I'm going to ask you a new question anyway about t tourism. Is there any chance of us getting a getting a holiday in Britain this summer? And if we if we can, would you encourage people to take a staycation? Yeah, look, I'd, I'd love to get the tourism sector up as as quickly as we possibly can. We've set this very ambitious. Uh, uh, plan to try and get it up uh, and running by the beginning of uh, July. Uh, we're working hard to be able to deliver on that. That is partly why I've set up this task force I announced at the beginning of this press conference, bringing together uh, experts, not, not just the people that I, I named at the beginning. When you see the full list, there's, there's other people from the tourism sector who will help advise on that. Clearly, we can only do it if it's safe to do so, because I think the worst thing for our tourism sector would be to start then see the R rate rise out of control, see a second peak that overwhelms the NHS that we then have to slam on the, the brakes again. But believe me, if we get to the point when we can have British tourism back, uh, apart perhaps from the Prime Minister, you won't find a, a bigger champion of, of the great British break than me. Uh, thank you. Over to um, Jane Kirby for PA. Thank you and good afternoon. Many football fans are hoping that the Premier League will return next month. Will the government be asking that these matches are available on free-to-air terrestrial television? Or is it acceptable for existing rights holders such as Sky and BT just to stream the matches on their YouTube platforms? And isn't it vital that these matches are shown on terrestrial to encourage people to adhere to the lockdown? And a, uh, a question for Professor Powers, please, on antibody testing. Antibody tests are becoming much more widely available on commercial websites. Should people be buying these tests to use at home? 
or is the intention that they will get one via the NHS for free at some point? And if so, when might that be? Uh, well, shall I take the, the Premier League um, first? So, um, uh, as I've said several times before, that I'm, I'm really keen that if we can get the Premier League back behind closed doors, uh, we should do that. Uh, the process for doing this is, is really threefold. So, first of all, we've already issued the guidance for um, carrying out uh, training uh, behind closed doors. That's non-contact training. That, those guidelines have already been published earlier this week. Uh, I hope, subject to the, the sign-off uh, by Public Health England and others, we will then uh, later this week, very shortly, get the guidance about how we can have uh, training in a, a contact environment. This is for, for elite sports, so they can start to build up. The final stage would then be the, the guidelines as to um, whether they can resume uh, behind closed doors. In doing that, we've been guided by the health advice. Uh, and I can update you again today. For the fourth time, there were meetings uh, between elite sports and uh, public health England to find out how we can do it safely. If we can do it safely, uh, I'd like us to be able to get it up and running uh, uh, towards uh, mid-June, mid if that's possible. Uh, in respect of uh, broadcasting rights, we have to respect the existing rights that, uh, that broadcasters have, but I do think we've actually got some flexibility because uh, if you look at uh, the on Saturday afternoons, uh, it has been the case that uh, Premier League matches uh, can't be broadcast on, on broadcasters. The idea was that they would be able to watch, people would be able to watch them in the stadium, so they didn't want to compete. Clearly, that won't be uh, possible if we compete behind closed doors. I think that creates an opportunity for us to be able to get some sport, uh, some Premier League, free to air. Uh, those discussions are ongoing. Um, I'm having productive discussions a couple of weeks ago. Uh, now I had the latest one with uh, Premier League, uh, the EFL, and uh, with the, the FA. I hope we can, can sort this out, and I also hope then we can get some more money going into the, the sport of football. I think we can find ourselves in a win-win situation. Stephen Bell. And, and uh, thank you for the question on antibody testing. So Public Health England have been evaluating the new antibody tests, the commercial tests that are becoming available, and I, I would have most confidence in that evaluation process uh, because I think that gives it uh, uh, the stamp uh, that, that we need in order to roll these tests out throughout the NHS. So as those tests are evaluated and they become available, they will be rolled out through health and social care settings. Initially, their use will be in those uh, settings. Uh, uh, and also for surveillance within the community so that we get some information on how many people uh, in, in the population may have uh, been infected by the virus. Uh, so that is uh, where we will start from. Um, I would caution against using uh, any uh, or uh, using any tests that might be made available uh, without knowing uh, quite uh, how good those tests are. So Public Health England, as I say, is evaluating them for the NHS. I would caution people against being tempted to, to, to have those tests. I think one other point to make about the antibody test. The antibody test shows you that you have had the virus. Uh, once you have the virus, the body's immune system develops antibodies against it, and it's those antibodies that are detected typically a number of weeks after you've had the virus. So it tells you you've had it. What we don't absolutely know at the moment is whether having antibodies and having the antibodies that are tested in those tests means that you won't get the virus again. We will only know that over time through the science of understanding the type of antibody that's being produced, but also by following people over time to see that when you develop an antibody and you test positive for an antibody, whether you get the virus again. So, so what I wouldn't want people to think is just because you test positive for the antibody, that it necessarily means that you can do something different in terms of social distancing or the way you behave. Because until we are absolutely sure about the relationship between the positive antibody test and immunity, I think we as scientists would say we need to tread cautiously going uh, further forward. That information will become available over time, but it will take some time to get there. Thank you. Jane, do you have any follow-up? Uh, yeah, if I could just ask uh, Professor Paris, um, does he mean by that, that that we can hope that everybody in the country will get access to an antibody test via the NHS for free? 
And uh, are there any discussions going on at the moment um, for a timeline for that? Would it, would it be, you know, end of this year, next year or so on? So what I would say is, is exactly what I said, is that we're at an early phase of these tests and where we will use them first is in health and, and probably social care settings for patients, obviously, uh, but also uh, for staff in those settings uh, where it is most important that we understand uh, about the infection. Thank you, Jane. And finally, to Mike Brown from Teesside Gazette. Thank you. Good afternoon. afternoon. Uh, our, Middlesbrough has the, currently the fourth highest infection rate for coronavirus in the country by population. Uh, it has the highest mortality rate in the northeast. And council leaders believe that its current R rate is around 0 0.85. Um, people in Middlesbrough can't sit on a park bench in their local park because our mayor believes that the risk from coronavirus is still too high. Um, I have two questions. Firstly, for the Secretary of State, um, previously local micro lockdowns have been discussed um, to tackle areas where there's a significant spike in new cases. Can you tell me what specific work the government has done to prepare vulnerable and hard hit areas like Middlesbrough uh, for a future significant spike in cases once lockdown measures are eased? Um, and how do you expect local authorities and public health teams to be able to enforce those? Uh, secondly, for Professor Powers, um, one council on Teesside has already said it will not reopen schools on June the 1st due to um, our uh, higher than average um, rate of infection in the North East. Um, it, does the UK's one size fits all policy for reopening schools on June the 1st, uh, will that work in places like Middlesbrough and, and the rest of Teesside? And how confident is the government that our already high R rate won't go back over one once schools are reopened. Well, thank you, and thank you for your question. As, and as uh, the Secretary of State responsible for media, it's great to hear the Teesside Gazette uh, asking a question at the, the press conference. Uh, first of all, you asked about uh, how we would uh, protect the most uh, vulnerable. Look, I, I'm under no illusions, and the government is under no illusions, about the, the challenges for the economy. Uh, of the necessary measures we've had to take to protect the NHS and, and save lives in terms of the, the measures that we have uh, taken. They've been very tough on, on the economy, social distancing and so on. That's why the Chancellor has announced an unprecedented package of measures to, to support people through these hard times. Uh, for example, the job retention scheme, meaning that literally millions of people who would otherwise have been made redundant have been able to, to keep their jobs. And that's millions of families that still have earners in their, their households. So uh, we, are, we are working hard through, through all of that. Um, on the point about um, local authorities and enforcing and the, the, the point about schools, I, I really hope that as, as we go through this, we can do so in a constructive uh, spirit, uh, whereby we can move together as a whole, uh, whole country and get children back to school for the, the reasons that, that I set out. And I do genuinely understand, I un really understand the concerns of teachers, I understand the concerns of uh, parents about whether this is safe to do so. That is why we are working so closely with them. But I think the way to do this is to, to do so in a constructive spirit of in engagement. I think on your, your final point about, uh, or your, maybe your second one, in individual outbreaks, that is why we're working so hard on the, the, the track and uh, trace. Uh, the fact that we've made this, this progress uh, already means that we will be able to, if there is outbreaks, it's important to understand what this track and trace means. It means that if we find someone's been infected by tracing, we can find out who else they've been in contact with and get those people to self-isolate and in that way control uh, the spread of the virus. Uh, and I think that's a very important measure. But Stephen. Yes, so, so thank you for the question. So um, I think the first point is, of course, on the R number. As long as it is below one, it means that the amount of infection in the community is reducing. Uh, it's simply that the lower it is, the faster that it is reducing, and the nearer it is to one, the slower it is reducing, but it is still reducing. So as long as it is below one, over time you will, we will see reductions in the number of infection in the community. I think that's a really important point to make. Secondly, as I, I've said before, it's, it's usual in infections and in epidemics to see variation uh, by geography. So, for instance, in the flu season that we have every winter, we see an increase in the number of flu cases. It's very typical to see that flu 
picks up and falls in different parts of the country at different times during the winter. So that is a very sort of natural pattern to an infectious disease. Um, Clearly, it's important that we have national measures in terms of uh, uh, lockdown measures and social distancing, uh, and I think that is the best way overall to, to approach this. But as we get to a point where we are talking about individual outbreaks, then um, there will be uh, a need for interventions around those outbreaks. And in fact, that's no different from the public health response that occurs for any outbreak of an infectious disease. A set of measures will be taken by public health colleagues, either in local councils or with Public Health England, uh, to ensure that a particular outbreak in a particular area is taken under control. So, so I think that is... Um, that is well tried and tested uh, public health policy. Contact tracing is part of that well tried and tested public health policy. And I think as we move forward in the months ahead, uh, that is the sort of approach uh, around outbreaks, specific outbreaks in, in defined communities uh, that the public health, my public health, health colleagues will increasingly be using. Uh, thank you. Mike, any follow ups? Yeah, please, Secretary Stiles. Yeah. Um, you mentioned um, the the package that has been um, brought forward already to support local authorities um, through the uh, through the pandemic. Um, once this, uh, once we're through the other side of this, um, does the government need to make towns like Middlesbrough and other uh, disadvantaged areas in the northeast um, a priority, um, so that we're not as hard as hard hit um, as we have been in the last ten years of uh, public spending cuts? Uh, because a, a link between deprivation and, um, and mortality rates in coronavirus has already been established by the ONS. Yes, uh, it's a good question. I, I know that the Prime Minister is passionate about this. This is why uh, we are committing uh, record investment, whether that is uh, levelling up the funding for schools so that uh, areas of the country have in the past been uh, less well funded for their schools compared to, say, London. We're increasing their funding. That's why we're investing in uh, transport infrastructure, the road and the rails. And indeed, in my own area, I'm passionate about making sure that uh, outside of London and the South East, people get the same opportunity for, for cultural experiences. And we invest in cultural experiences in the way that perhaps in the past we've focused too much on London. So that is very much uh, an important part of the work we're doing. Thank you for your question. Thank you, everyone. That now uh, concludes the press conference.